Hello and welcome to our second webinar in the webinar series focusing on the value of natural science collections. My name is Furupera Tambani. I am the science communication officer for the NSCF. We are natural science collections facility. Um, the NSCF is a network of institutions holding or having natural science collections um, and using them for research. And um, they are also considered our natural heritage. But if you don't know what we mean by natural science collections, we mean plants and animals that are dead and um, that are preserved for science reasons and um, to keep our heritage. If you don't know where to find them, you can find them at natural science um, museums all over the country, um, in universities and in science councils. All these institutions are members or partners of the NSCF. You can find out more about us as well as our partner institutions on our website. If you go to www.nscf.org.za and our social media platforms, you can find us on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram. Um, we also have a YouTube channel and we have just uh, opened a LinkedIn page. So do find us there. Now, um, before we get started, today we are focusing on the fight against pests and diseases. Uh, we will know that farmers at all scales are impacted by pests and diseases, and these um, affect their crops. The natural science collections are used to identify these specimens and in turn helps in development of pest management strategies and determining which pesticides farmers can use to get rid of these diseases and pests. This also affects uh, the Department of Agriculture in the case that there is national risk that may threaten food security as well as our economy. We also will cover um, animals, um, uh, research or work being done on animals that transfer certain diseases to or viruses to humans. Um, so we can move to the next slide just for some guidelines, webinar guidelines, um, just so that we know how to interact with each other when we are here. So if you can please keep your contributions helpful and considerate of the host and other participants. So in basically, let's be kind to one another. You can use the chat box to say hello. So let's greet each other. You can do this right away. Use the chat box to say hello and let us know where you are coming from, whether it's an in uh, institution, organization, school, university, whatever the case may be. You can begin with this right now. For example, I would say, hello, my name is Furupero. I am from the NSCF hub team, or I am from the NSCF, simple as that. You can also use the chat box, the Q&A box, excuse me. Um, hi, Renee, I see you got us started. Renee is from Vets. Uh, thanks, Renee, for joining us. You can use the Q&A box to add any questions that you may have during the webinar. Your questions can be to us, the hosts, or it can be to our speakers today. We will be answering um, some of those questions at the end of the webinar. If we don't get enough time to answer all questions, you can go ahead and ask your question on the webinar link, which will be on YouTube. We're also live streaming to Facebook. So you can put your questions on either YouTube or Facebook. Remember to visit our website, nfcf.org.za for any other information, whether regarding collections, the value of collections, um, we also have a collections management course going on. So we have all that information there. 
Um, let's move to the next slide. I'm now going to give a brief introduction of the guests that we have. Um, we have Simon, Simon van Noort, who is coming from um, Easy Go Museums of South Africa. So Simon is the curator of entomology at the Easy Go South African Museum. He holds a PhD on the systematics and phylogeny of fig wasps from Rhodes University. His research focuses on the systematics and biology of wasps. wasps. He is an avid field biologist and has participated in a number of research expeditions across Africa. The discovery and documentation of the wealth of unknown insect um, diversity is his passion. We will then move to Robin Lyle. Robin is a senior researcher technician whose first love is the spider, but recently she has been asked to assist with training activities within the ARC. This um, was the starting point of the work that she's going to present today. She has been doing taxonomy since her honors year at university and has helped out with training activities for the last few years in the ARC. Last but not least is Lee Richards. She is the curator of mammals at the Durban Natural Science Museum. Her work uh, focus is on small mammal tech. I almost said technology, <laughs> small mammal taxonomy with a special interest in bats. She has been in the field for 10 years in the position of a curator, but has been involved in small mammals research for the past 16 years. She loves how diverse her work is. It's a combination of collection management, research and field work. What, um, an amazing uh, uh, panel of, of speakers we have today. I'm so excited to hear what they have to say and share with us today. Um, let's move to the next slide. Um, Chanel is going to take us through an introduction of what the NSCF is, as well as some background information or intro into our topic for today. Chanel is the NSCF project manager and um, she'll take over. Chanel. Thank you, Fulu, and welcome everyone within the NSCF network, but also a very special welcome to our guests that are not part of the network. So as Fulu said, this is our second webinar in our Value of Collections showcase. Sorry, dogs running. In the previous webinar, I gave an overview about this project and also why natural science collections matter. And you can find this four minute clip on our NSCF YouTube channel, along with the previous webinar that dealt with how the collections contribute to South Africa's food security and agricultural needs. If you would like to read more about the collections institutions that make up the NSCF network, all the wonderful collections that they hold and the fascinating stories they have to tell, visit our website and Value of Collections webpage. So today we are focusing on why collections are paramount in tracking the progression of pests, pathogens and vectors, and also how the collections and researchers help to fight these pests and diseases. And our guests will be touching on two areas. So um, the first one is the services offered by natural science collections, which feed into decision making related to pest and disease control in nature, and specifically agriculture. So for example, um, we can look at the shuttle Bora beetle, a pest native to Southeast Asia, which made its appearance in South Africa not so long ago. And it's had a devastating impact on both indigenous and exotic trees. 
Natural science collections assist in the identification of pests like these and also contribute to developing pest, pest management strategies to use. Secondly, collections also contribute to protecting human health through research into zoonotic diseases that can spill over to humans. Approximately 60 to 70 percent of new diseases affecting humans have zoonotic origin. Collections are key in understanding these diseases. For example, we can look at mosquitoes. So mosquitoes transmit diseases like West Nile virus, yellow fever, and malaria. In hopes of preventing outbreaks of these deadly diseases, scientists at museum collections um, use the collections to learn more about the taxonomy, biology, and distribution of mosquitoes that transmit diseases to humans. In one such case, um, a sterile insect technology is being used to sterilize mosquitoes that carry the virus. And then also looking at the 1918 deadly influenza, uh, influenza virus, which came from birds. So now scientists are using fluid preserved bird specimens that were collected in the 19th and 20th centuries to extract viral samples from the birds and hope to unlock the genetic secrets from these flu strains. So without the physical specimens and their associated data found in collections, this research and our fight against pests and diseases would not be possible. And without further ado, I'm sure you can't wait to hear from our guest speakers today. Back to you, Fulu. Thanks so much for that, Chanel. It's um, such a nice intro. Um, we will now get started with our guests. We will start with Simon van Nord from Easy Co uh, Museum, and he will talk about parasitoid wasps, why they are essential for our survival. Uh, Simon? Thank you, Fulu, and uh, thank you also to the NSCF for uh, the opportunity to talk about parasitoid wasps. Today I'm going to talk about um, uh, why parasitoid wasps are essential for our survival and uh, why we really do need them in our lives. And I'm also going to briefly touch on and highlight the value of museum collections and uh, the, the essential baseline data that they provide, which is necessary for um, making informed conservation management decisions. All right, so wasps, bees and ants uh, belong to the order Hymenoptera. It's a hyper diverse order of insects. They're ecologically and economically very, very important. And they play roles as pollinators and parasitoids and predators. And through these means, they are providing critical ecosystem services. So most of us know that uh, bees are very, very important pollinators, but wasps also visit flowers and they play an important role in pollination. And both these groups play a critical role in the functioning of any ecosystem. Um, that includes the evolution of floral species riches and also food security. So it's almost, well, one in every three mouthfuls of food that we eat is reliant on pollination services provided by insects. And the global value of pollination worth um, is, is estimated at more than three trillion um, US dollars. So some of these hymenoptera, in particular the ants, also play a valuable role as uh, indicator species in conservation and ecological monitoring. And ants, uh, along with termites, are critical role players in nutrient recycling. They, both these groups are super abundant and are responsible for the majority of turnover of nutrients in, in ecosystems. And both parasitoid and also predatory wasps are obviously playing a, a vital eco ecological role as controllers of other insect populations. And this includes pests that uh, attack our agricultural and forestry industries and also impact on human and animal health. And most of the, many of these parasitoid wasps have vast potential for use in managed biocontrol programs. 
But to manage and conserve these insects, we actually need to inventory and describe the species that are involved. This is a critical fundamental prerequisite uh, before we can understand the role that they're playing in ecological processes. So just about every single species of insect and arachnid in the world is attacked by parasitoid wasps. And in many cases by more than one species of, of parasitoid wasp. Many of these parasitoids are highly host specific because over evolutionary times of time, they've had to overcome the natural defense of the host insect or arachnid. But there are some that are, are more uh, widespread in their tastes and they attack uh, more than one host insect or, or arachnid species. Now, some parasitoid wasps are actually invasive pests themselves, and others may be attacking host insects that are of con uh, critical conservation concern. And so it's, it's really, really very important to understand the ecological role and the biology of these parasitoid uh, wasps uh, in any given host interaction. So the order Hymenoptera is by far the most species rich insect order. Um, but that is when we take the undescribed species into account. Currently there are about 150,000 described species of um, Hymenoptera. And uh, beetles, there are more described species of beetles, but if we take the undescribed species into account, um, the Hymenoptera are by far the richest. And this is based on an extrapolation well, an understanding and a realization that there are two to three parasitoid wasp species associated with every other insect species on this planet. In Africa, we have about 20,000 described species of, of Hymenoptera, but I estimate that we have only described somewhere between five and 20% 20, 20 of the species. And the real, the true figure is somewhere closer to 100,000 to half a million species. So effectively, we know very little about our incredible insect species diversity. And even with the described species, we know very little about their biology and the ecological um, interaction. So there's a huge amount of work uh, that we still need to do. So obviously through their lifestyle strategy, parasitoid wasps control other insect populations. And without this natural control, we would experience massive population explosions of insects and many of these would be in plague proportions that would decimate our environment, attacking our agricultural and forestry industries as well. So parasitoids are essential contributors to food security, uh, also natural product resource security, such as uh, forestry products, and to maintaining our environmental life support systems in a healthy state. And then as hyperparasitoids, there's some parasitoids that attack other parasitoids. So the parasitoid wasps themselves are controlling populations of other parasitoid wasps. And they attack just about every de developmental stage of the host insects from eggs through to adults. And uh, different species often specialize on a certain developmental stage of the host. Some are egg, egg parasitoid specialists, others attack caterpillars and emerge as adults from the, from the pupae, others are pure pupil parasitoids. But in any given host web uh, uh, scenario, there are numerous feeding levels, there are numerous trophic levels, and it's a, a very compli complicated interaction and quite difficult to unravel as to who's eating who in these systems. So you can have a parasitoid attacking a host insect species, and then another parasitoid attacking that parasitoid, and another parasitoid attacking the parasitoid that's attacking the parasitoid that's attacking the host. So you get a whole hierarchy of uh, trophic levels. And it's not ne necessarily a, a, a vert vertical hierarchical hierarchy. It can actually go horizontally as well. All right, so just out of interest, there's uh, the smallest insects in the world are parasitoid wasps. Um, uh, the smallest winged insect is a species of fairy fly, my married wasp, uh, Kiki Huna. And at uh, 0.15 millimeters, this is a fully formed adult female. There's in fact a smaller one, a wingless male of another fairy fly wasp species that's only 0.13 of a millimeter. So these, these fully formed adult wasps are, are, are almost only a tenth of a millimeter long. And the reason that they are so small is that uh, they attack other eggs of other insects. And often those eggs of insects are very, very tiny. 
And the wasp, the parasitoid wasp larvae is dependent on the food resource that's provided by that egg. There's one larva, la, uh, wasp larvae developing in each egg. So that uh, resource constrains the size of the, of the larvae and subsequently the size of the adult wasp. So many parasitoid wasps are used uh, in biocontrol programs, deliberately used to control pest species of insects that are attacking uh, agricultural products, and also to control alien invasive insects and plants. And this reduces the need for insecticides and uh, subsequently mitigates the results and knock-on effects on, on the health of our broader environment. And um, yeah, so they're also invasive species, both insects um, and uh, plants that have major negative impacts on our indigenous ecosystems. And these are often kept under control by parasitoid wasps. And on the left here, we have an example of the alien invasive large cabbage white, uh, the, the two paras main parasitoids in South Africa that attack this, this alien invasor. Um, invader. There's a Cotesia agglomerata, which is a braconid wasp that attacks the caterpillars. And then there's a, a pupal parasitoid, um, Terramalis puparum, uh, that lays its eggs in the pupae and, and emerges from the pupae. And these, both these two uh, wasps uh, effectively control um, uh, the large cabbage white, which, which feeds on, on, on cabbages, obviously. And just to highlight some uh, other uh, Cases of parasitoids that contribute to our food security. Um, there's a parasitoid wasp, uh, Cotesia plutella, that attacks the diamondback moth, uh, whose caterpillars feed on cabbages and cruciferaceae. And this moth species is actually uh, resistant to insecticides. So the deploy deployment of this biocontrol agent, which was uh, imported from Europe, is actually very important to control the population of the diamondback moth. Another um, species that attacks our agricultural industry is the potato tuber moth, uh, whose caterpillars feed on potatoes, obviously. This moth originated from South America, and we imported a, a parasitoid wasp, Pantelis subandinus, which uh, effectively controls uh, this, uh, this uh, uh, agricultural pest, and in the process reduces the need for, for the use of insecticides. The false codling moth is a worldwide pest of cotton and nuts and citrus. And it's a species that actually originated in Africa. And this is controlled also by an egg parasitoid. This is a little trichromatid wasp. And the total length of that body is about half a millimeter long. The scale bar is a tenth of a tenth of a millimeter. And this is a fairly effective uh, control agent of uh, the false codling moth. So turning to our natural resource, uh, Security, um, the forestry products, uh, which are impacted by alien inv invasive, uh, in this case, it's a wasp, it's a Cyrex wood wasp, and so the larvae are wood borers, and they attack uh, the Monterey pine, Pinus radiata, and we imported a parasitoid wasp, uh, Ebalia, that is a very effective control agent of this uh, wood boring uh, wasp uh, invasive species. The other wood borers, this is a carpenter moth in the family Cossidae, and it's an agricultural pest attacking quince and apple trees, but uh, recently it's emerged as a, as a major pest of our plantations, our eucalyptus plantations. And a couple of years ago, we uh, described a new species of parasitoid wasp um, that was reared from logs that were infested with the larvae of this moth. And although we haven't got a direct association yet, this parasitoid wasp is probably attacking the moth larvae and hence there's potential for use as a, bio, a natural biocontrol agent uh, of this pest species. So invasive water weeds are also a major issue. Uh, this is okay, the Brazilian water weed um, uh, is a problem in South Africa. It is controlled by a biocontrol agent, um, uh, a, a leaf mining aquatic uh, fly, but this fly is then attacked by parasitoid wasps, which potentially then have a negative impact on the biocontrol of this invasive water weed. Uh, but then we do also have a hyperparasitoid that attacks the parasitoid wasps that are attacking the, the fly. So this one's probably beneficial in the system. Uh, but this is all uh, new research, so there's a lot of work to be done on this system as well. Another invasive water uh, uh, species is a water hyacinth. 
And uh, we recently established that uh, indigenous wasp is uh, attacking the plant hopper that was introduced as a biocontrol agent. This is the plant hopper with the wasp larvae um, protruding from it. And the adult uh, female has got claspers on her front legs and she uses these claspers to grab a living plant hopper. Uh, and while she's got it under control, she lays an egg into the plant hopper and then lets it go alive. So it continues its, uh, its normal, normal life and the wasp larvae benefits from the, the host insects, um, natural camouflage and ability uh, to avoid predators. So although parasitoid wasps, uh, most of their nutrition comes from the larval stage um, they, when they're feeding on the host, the adult wasps also need uh, nutrients and they often get this from body fluids of the, the host in the process of laying an egg into it. They puncture the, the exoskeleton of the host, uh, host insect, but they also need to feed on nectar for the energy requirements. And in this process, they pr uh, perform critical pollination services. Some of these uh, uh, interactions are highly specialized. The most well-known is the example of an obligate mutualism that exists between fig wasps and their host fig trees, neither part partner of which uh, can survive without the other. The fig trees are completely res uh, reliant on these tiny parasitoid fig wasps for pollination, and uh, they can't breed anywhere else except inside figs. Now, fig trees are keystone species in tropical ecosystems. There are many other animals that rely on the food resources provided by the, the right fig crop for their own survival uh, from lizards right up through to, to the major, uh, major primates. So lots of these pollinating wasps would have uh, certainly have ca catastrophic cascading effects on, on ecosystem functioning. So to end off, I'm going to touch a bit on the value of museum collections and uh, the essential baseline data uh, resources that we uh, conserve in these collections. And though, although we have many, many specimens and species uh, already collected and conserved in our, in our collections, with a rapid increase in rates of human-induced environmental destruction and the habitat transformation that we're seeing at the moment due to, to these anthropomorphic effects and to climate change, um, the implementation of ongoing initiatives to, to survey our our ecosystems is, is really a matter of priority. And uh, yeah, it's the vast majority of vegetation types in South Africa really are undersampled. And every new inventory survey that we um, implement, it actually produces hundreds to thousands of undescribed species of wasps. So over the last 30 years, I've implemented numerous continuous uh, quantified inventory surveys and uh, uh, based on uh, counts of in the samples and extrapolations, I estimate that over 10 million specimens have been collected through these inventory surveys. And these are all housed in the Ezekiel South African Museum collection. And so we've got this with this wealth of unlocked biodiversity data. And uh, although they're safeguarded in our, mu our collections, we really need to unlock them, process them. 300,000 of these specimens have already been curated and identified, and their associated metadata mobilized and digitized on, on specify. But we need this mobilized metadata. It's essential baseline data to assess rates of spatial and temporal change in our invertebrate species richness and, um, and abundance. Um, so we can make informed decisions about what is happening with our, our biodiversity. So given that we have this uh, very limited baseline data, we're not able to assess the, the, the local South African extent of the insect Armageddon the globe is experiencing. And uh, as I've said already, this is a goldmine of biodiversity data that we need to mobilize um, to inform rates of decline in our insect population. It's, there is a, there's absolutely no doubt that in South Africa, we are also rapidly losing uh, much of our biodiversity heritage, but we really, really don't know. We don't have any idea of the rate that this is happening at. So with the leverage of appropriate resources to mobilize this data and through um, the research conducted by international specialists, we will be in a far better position to make these critical assessments. And yeah, we need to understand that we're losing species to extinction faster than we can discover and describe them. So it really is a race against time. And yeah, so the capacity constraints, uh, 
you know, uh, yeah, getting on top of the, the huge numbers of specimens that we've collected, uh, there are major, major logistical issues here. Um, it's based on uh, time that it's taken to identify and curate specimens and mobilize the metadata. Um, I estimate that it's to, just to do a million specimen takes a thousand years for one person, but we could get it done with in 25 years if we have 40 research assistants. But this is very expensive. It's going to need 150 million rand for this. So we've got this major bottleneck here already. And then we've got another bottleneck. Uh, we've only described five to 20% of the African Afri uh, Afrotropical wasp species. Another major bottleneck here in terms of systematics. And uh, yeah, um, if we look at uh, a little graph showing uh, what we've inventoried so far, this little dot down the bottom, so that uh, it looks like the um, horizontal scale is not, not showing, but that's effort. And then uh, on the vertical scale, that's time. So we've done this, this small amount of inventory surveys and we've already got this major bottleneck at data mobilization level um, and at systematics level. We need to do this amount of inventory survey, which is obviously gonna have a knock on effect onto the, the, the uh, bottleneck that we've already got. Um, you know, and this impacts the whole uh, value chain up uh, through the different, uh, spheres of curation and identification and digitization of our, our biodiversity, ultimately um, implementing uh, uh, this data in, in to, uh, for con effective conservation management decisions or, or policies and, you know, for the realization of benefit of science and society. This is a long process. This is, doesn't take a, a year. It doesn't take five years. It takes 10 or 20 years from sampling to actually realize the benefit to science and society in the end. Yeah, so it is now more important than it has ever been to mobilize taxonomic resources and to, to leverage appropriate funding to focus our effort on, on the discovery, description, and documentation of our wealth of unknown species. It really, really, really is important. And there's a nice little paper that was published last year uh, by Cardoso et al. on uh, scientists warning to humanity on insect extinctions. And I'd really encourage you to go and uh, uh, download that. It's, it's, it's openly available and uh, read it. It gives a nice overview of where we, we act and, and what we need to do to mitigate uh, the impact we're having on our, on our very own life support systems. Um, you know, it's just not sustainable anymore. And in the end, it's, yeah, it's extremely sobering to realize that the vast majority of unknown insect species are in fact parasitoid wasps. And so if uh, anyone has got a, an interest in pursuing taxonomy and they want to work on a super unknown, hyper diverse group of insects, um, the parasitoid wasps are wide open for investigation. And uh, finally, it just uh, it leaves me to acknowledge uh, the many uh, uh, funding agencies that have contributed to this initiative over many of the years. Thank you very much for your attention and uh, uh, we'll receive questions at the end. Thank you so much, Simon. Such an informative talk. I think um, I say for everyone that there is no doubt that we need this um, insects, we need these wasps, um, and we need to find a way of preserving them, as many of them as possible. And I think it's a problem that many of them we haven't even identified, so there's still much work to be done. Now we will move on to Robin Lyle. Robin will talk to us about the famous fall army worm. Um, the worm that is causing a misfit in in her millis. She said specifically, my millis. <laughs> and she's going to explain why. <laughs> Thanks. Thanks. Thank you so much, Paulo. Thank you to everyone for allowing me to talk today and to give you some interesting projects that we've been running all related to fall army worm. And I do refer to it as the misfit in my millis. Through your, your final little bit later in the talk, but I've actually planted a hectare or two of maize myself, and I learned a lot. So let's get started. Um, so um, a lot of people have heard about fall armyworm. It was a recorded or had an outbreak in 2017 in South Africa. 
It's a polyphagous pest that's classified as an A1 quarantine organism in Europe and the Mediterranean Plant Protection Organizations. Uh, it's a quarantine pest in South Africa. Uh, we had a sample sent into us and our very own entomologist, Vivian Ace, did the, the morphological identification. Oh, here we go. Uh, there's eight, rector, eight species known of Spidoptera in, in the Afrotropical region. The fall army worm identification was done by using the male genitalia, and it was the, the specimens com, from the South African National Collection of, uh, of Insects was used to compare. And I can tell you, I've seen someone do a genitalia dissection on a moth. It's a very complex process. And if you'd like to see it yourself, there's a link to the YouTube video where Vivian actually explains how it's done. And then further, once the morphological ID was done, they used CO1 barcodes as well as TPI to help confirm the identification. So just to give you some background about the South African National Collection of Insects, it's now over 100 years old. It has an extensive taxonomic, bi biological and biogeographical reference source for the Afrotropical region. And it has a number of different orders in it. Um, you are welcome to reach out to the entomologist or to me via yeah, biosystematics to, to access and to make use of it. Um, it's really a, an amazing collection, true, truly amazing. So what happens after we had the accurate ID? Um, so I was very fortunate to, to be involved in the spin-off projects or spin-off training projects. There were a lot of other research projects done by our insect ecology colleagues. And the first of that was a static training, a static regional training. Uh, so basically what happens, there was a big conference, this is obviously before COVID, in Botswana, where the STORA project was established. This is project, STORA stands for the support towards operationalization of the static regional agricultural policy. And the aim of it is to enhance information of agricultural production, sustainability and competitive for uh, evidence-based decision-making and improving access to markets through the implementation of plants and animal pests and disease control strategies on a regional level. So when they talk about regional, it's throughout the static region and then facilitating implementation of some components of the regional food and nutrition security strategy, um, which is actually very exciting. So working within the static region to try and control full army room. And it's, it's, it's really, it's there's different languages. It's, it's a very different experience of, uh, to actually be involved in a, a regional training event compared to a national one. So there were two training, two week long training workshops held. This was lucky. We literally got this training through just before we went into our national lockdown. We didn't just include fall army worm. Um, the FAO selected, there is a, a um, two other pests and diseases. So it was fall armyworm, two to absolute and maize from the process disease, but we're only gonna focus on fall armyworm. And what we did is we started with identification and taxonomy. Um, it wasn't just, oh, you look at a slide and you see it, there were physical samples with physical damage. They did the biology and the ecology of fall armyworm, different methods of control. Um, as you know, you don't, there's, there's various methods from cultural control to biological control to chemical control. Then each country within the static region gave the feedback of what they are doing, what they would like to do. And then it, there was time to send and develop of a, a design to send and develop a regional strategic management plan. So it, it's a very intense week long workshop that takes place. And as I said before, it contains both of theory and hands on training. The, there was a lot of, there was PowerPoints as well as actually going for the, the, the participants could see the specimens at its various life cycles. They could see the damage on the maze at different stages. So it's, we spent a lot of time planning and preparing for this workshop. And from this workshop, we then spread, spread down into a regional workshop, uh, into a national workshop, which was very similar to what we did in the SADC region. It included more pests and diseases. It had four armyworm tubes, absoluta, um, the ornamental fruit fly, as well as maize needs on the process, and um, TR4, which is a fungus that attacks bananas. And it was the people trained were national and provincial agricultural staff. The only problem was this happened post COVID, as you can see from all the masks. And we had to um, basically fit in what was done over two or three weeks, two weeks in South Africa for those three pests and diseases. We had to squash in a week, so it was very intense. There were representatives from all the provinces except the Western Cape. It's because they don't have full army um, presence. 
they also have different planting seasons to the rest of the country. Anyone was wondering. Okay, so this is where I get really excited. This was an amazing project to run. We then rolled out from, from the national training, we actually went to two communities and we rolled out training with a small hold of farmers. So we did what we call the FAO Fall Army Room Farm and Field School. The FAO is the Food and Agriculture Organization of the United Nations. And we were approached with the FAO and through the Department of Agriculture, Land Reform and Rural Development to roll out a farmer field school. Um, the idea with this was we, we, when I say we as the ARC, we've done a lot of research activities, research projects on Fall Army Room. And the, um, our Institute of Plant Health and Protection is very well suited with that background to actually roll out a farmer field school. So what happened was two communities were selected. Uh, in those communities, 20 women and youth were selected to participate. And we chose two communities based on their proximity to the neighboring countries, as well as the research we've done, we found out that these are four army room hotspots where they can overwinter. So just to give an idea of where these communities were based, the one was the Chiamba community in Toyando, and the other one um, is the Makukeni community, which is about hundred, uh, well, about an hour and a half from Mayalan, and it's literally four kilometers away from the Swaziland border. Um, so it's quite, it was quite an exciting project, to say the least. So what were the flow of activities for the, for, for the Farmer Field School project? Well, first we had questionnaires with the participating members of the communities. Step two is we did aggregate the training. Step three is we did a field trial where the community or the, the staff, the ladies being trained, actually could implement the skills that they learned from, from the agri-seater training. So the first questionnaire, we luckily again just got this out before we went into our level five lockdown. And the questionnaire is related to the socioeconomic circumstances in the community, what they use to control for army room, do they use pesticides, do they use a cultural control method, um, so this helped give us an idea of what we would do when we actually got to the field trial part. So after we eventually were allowed to travel, we did our every seat of training. This was done early September and we did it, we did, we provided every seat of training because it's nationally recognized and we covered three different unit standards. Um, so that this also enables the trainees to potentially use this qualification for future employment. In, Step three, which is probably the most challenging part of it all. Um, and everyone keeps telling me once the, the, the seed is in the ground, it'll be easier, which is not the case. So here you can see two examples or the two field layouts we did. Ideally, we would have liked to have the Makukeni planting layout, which is a randomized square design. But given the layout of the Jombo um, land that we got, we had to adapt. So what we did is we divided into different squares, three to four replicas of each treatment with four treatments. The first treatment was genetically modified maize. The second treatment was conventional maize with no control, so that we just left it, nothing, we applied nothing to it. The third treatment was the conventional maize with a cultural control, which is the application of ash into the growing points of the maize. This came out as a method used by both of these communities to control the fall army worm. Um, treatment four was the conventional maize with a chemical control, which is the application of pesticide. So, this is a very simplified version of the activities that took place. We planted by hand with the ladies and the, the youth in the community at each planting site in late October. And then we went back about two weeks, two weeks later, applied our fertilizer. And then with the FAO, we showed them how to use the Farm Use Fall Army Room Monitoring and Early Warning System app. This is something that the FAO has rolled out throughout the continent to specifically help smallholder farmers monitor Fall Army Room. Uh, after that two weeks, well, at that two week period, we also um, started monitoring for fall army worm, and then we started the application of the treatments, which was applied throughout the growing season until the maize got too big to, to comfortably apply the ash or the, the pesticides. So the monitoring of the fall army worm is done weekly by the communities and the ARCs, the site visits monthly. And then in true, in the, in the true experience of this entire project, nothing can always go according to plan. When we were hoping to harvest, Cyclone Eloise hit and the roads and the planting sites became so wet it was inaccessible. So we ended up only harvesting in April 2021 of this year. And we did this again for the first few days with just the ARC team. We collected the data that we wanted and then the rest was done with the communities 
with the ladies where they actually showed us how they do it and how they remove, traditionally they remove the, the kernels from the cob. It was a real eye-opening experience and then um, we, were, we completed it. So one of the most amazing take-home messages for me was that the application of ash into the growing points of the maize does actually seem to control for armyria really well. It's quite a, a cheap method compared to pesticides. A small bottle of pesticide can be a couple thousand rands where ash can from your growing ash from your cooking fire can be used. Literally, you apply it to the growing point of maize, and it, it actually helps to, to control the full army worm. Um, we did not, we weren't able to show this statistically yet. This is just very preliminary results, and we really are hoping to do this project again with a different community, because um, we learned a lot this time around, myself and the team. And one of the, some of the big lessons we learned is that ownership of the end product, which is the maize, is really important. At the one planting site, the maize was belonged to the ladies who did it, the work, and the other side was, was to the chief. Um, there's very big differences in expectations what people experience. Um, ongoing community is really important. Uh, communication is really important, and it's on the various scales that a project like this needs to be done. Um, it's really, really important, and you really need to have trainees who are, are passionate about agriculture because it's. It, Agriculture is not easy. I learned that the hard way. So I just have to go back to what Paula said about my maize. Here you can see two pictures of our beautiful maize growing. I literally felt like I shed tears next to these maize fields and I helped plant them. So it was a really humbling experience in my own mind. And then um, it's really important to meet all the role players, not just the, the agricultural representatives or like that, to actually go to the community and meet the community before you start so that everyone's on the same page when you begin. So it's, it was really cool. Um, so our proposed way forward is we'd really like to do this again, and we'd apply a lot of the lessons that we learned the first time around to this, which would make it much easier. Then we really have to send a massive thank you to both the communities we worked in. The ladies, they were amazing. Um, the provincial representatives from the local agricultural departments, they, they helped us every step of the way. We'd like to thank Bayer for the sponsorship of the seeds and the cutworm application using the trial, as well as to the local agricultural, co uh, agricultural college Johambo for the maize thrasher. Um, traditionally, maize is removed by hand of the kernels by the ladies there, and the maize thrasher just helps speed up the process a lot. So it was, yeah, it's an intense experience. So what made all of this possible? And it, like, it seems very random all out there, but if we did not have an a, a accurate identification of that pest, we would not be able to do anything. We, it's essential to be able to know for sure what you are dealing with, to be able to control this pest properly. So for that, you need taxonomists who are skilled and knowledgeable and able to do ident accurate identifications. And if you don't have an accurate identification, the research you are going to do is going to be flawed. You, you're not actually going to know what you're dealing with. And those taxonomists are linked to, to collections. And without those collections, there's no way it could happen. So I just want to say thank you very, very much. Thank you for enjoying, enjoying me in my excitement of my minis and my mischief in my maze. Thank you, everyone. So thank you everyone for joining us this afternoon. I'm going to talk to you about urban invaders and the threats that pose. Most notably, um, the four-legged furry little creatures that we find running around um, our cities and, and houses. So by now, everyone is familiar with the term zoonotic disease. These are a category of diseases that are transmissible between animals and people. Um, obviously, everyone, the, the, the buzzword now is COVID-19, which is classed as a zoonotic disease, albeit that the origin is still a bit uncertain. So rodents are important reservoirs of zoonotic disease. Um, a paper by Han et al. 2015 said of the um, almost 2,300 rodent taxa, um, just under 220 species are known reservoirs of zoonotic, uh, of almost 70 uh, zoonotic diseases. And of these, 79 species could carry two or more um, zoonoses. Um, however, uh, rodents of, um, of interest are your ubiquitous or invasive alien species um, such as Rattus norvegicus, the Norway rat, and Rattus rattus. Um, reason being, they are present in urbanized environments and are closely associated with humans. So 
when it come, one of the most um, well-known uh, zoonotic diseases is plague. And while it is a rodent associated disease, the actual vector is the oriental or tropical rat flea associated with these rodents. So these fleas become infected with the plague bacterium as seen there in the, um, the image shown. And what happens to infected fleas is um, the bacteria actually creates a biofilm in the foregut of, of the infected flea. And this essentially creates um, a biological blockage, uh, preventing the, the flea from effectively consuming a, a blood meal. This in turn uh, causes the flea to bite more, leading to more possible instances of transferring the bacteria through the flea uh, saliva to potential hosts. Now, this is a diagra diagrammatic um, representation of the various transmission cycles um, involving plague in animals and humans. So the enzootic cycle is um, transmission within um, wild animal populations, in this particular instance, a rodent population. And then owing to uh, certain or various external factors, there might be a peak in infections amongst um, you know, this rodent population. And it is, this, it is at this point that it's likely that um, the disease could potentially transfer to domestic or commensal um, animals, mammals in particular, and then transfer occurs to the human population. Now plague, as a disease manifests as one of three types. The most infamous one is bubonic plague, also responsible for the Black Death of, um, of Europe, but also you get pneumonic plague associated with the respiratory system, and this can be transmitted from person to person, it doesn't necessarily involve the, um, a flea bite, um, as well as septicemic plague. But um, the more commonly known one is bubonic plague. Sorry, yeah, that's just denoting the zoonotic cycle. Apologies, I'm not sure why the slide advance is taking long. Okay, so plague in Africa. Um, would you believe it or not? Um, globally, plague is still present in parts of Africa, um, the Americas and Asia. It's categorized as a re-emerging disease with 1,000 to about 5,000 human cases reported annually to the World Health Organization. So this article published by uh, Mierinki, um, in 2008 actually modeled um, uh, suitable areas for plague in Africa. And as you can see, Southern Africa does indeed come out as um, a highly, highly suitable um, uh, area for uh, instances of, of plague. Um, so of course, with this comes the need for surveillance. And in fact, um, although plague, the last known case of plague was recorded in 1982, in 2016, um, as part of the National Plague Surveillance Program, um, officials from Gauteng actually um, went testing rats from, collected from a, a rubbish dump in Tembisa, in the Gauteng uh, province, actually did pick up a rat that tested positively for plague antibodies. Now the origin of this rat and the origin of the infection is still unknown, but again it highlights the need for undertaking surveillance in large um, metropolitan er metropolis areas in South Africa. Durban is one such of a bustling metropolis. It is considered to have one of the busiest ports in Africa and the potential for um, plague to be transferred from rats as stowaways on um, commercial vehicles. The port receives about um, 4,500 commercial shipping uh, vessels um, into the port every year. Um, so the potential for plague is, is always, um, always there. As such, the museum um, has served as a processing hub for what we call the Etiquini Plague Surveillance Program, um, a program in effect from 2003 
um, when my predecessor, Professor Peter Taylor, um, held the position that I currently hold. And this is work done in collaboration with Etiquini Municipalities Environmental Health and Vector Control Units. Here we have um, technical assistant in the mammal department, Zama Welasi, um, hosting a community engagement session a session with a colleague from the vector control unit just to unpack details regarding the rodent um, trapping program within that precinct. Now areas that are su surveilled in, as part of this program and especially with regards to trapping are obviously the harbour, um, but also throughout the CBD and informal trading sites. Also where the public has reported sightings of rodents or where there is multiple evidence uh, pointing to a rodent infestation as seen in the top right picture, where you can see a, a collection of rodent droppings. Those are areas that will be targeted by our vector control department um, to actually go in and trap and um, control rodents within um, that, that area. These are images taken by um, Andrew Carter of the Durban Natural Science Museum. So that is what it looks like. So rodents are live trapped. They are brought to the museum for processing by Zama and her Ever Ready team. Although I must say when they do see these, <laughs> these traps full of rodents, uh, there is a, a bit of... <laughs> Like, oh my gosh, not again. Um, but nonetheless, they are aware of the importance of, of this um, program in ensuring public health um, throughout Etiquini. Obviously, with this comes the necessity for adhering to Section 20 protocols and procedures um, as advised by NICD. And um, yeah, so there they are donning their PPE, even through the hot and humid summer months. Um, it's all to, to ensure their, their safety. There they are getting ready to process some rodents and collect samples. So also the, um, the specimens are um, prepared as museum specimens with skulls extracted and are then taxonomically identified. And as you heard in Robin and Simon's talks, um, taxono um, definitive taxonomic identification of these potential vectors is vastly important when it comes to disease. You can only fully understand a disease once you fully understand the host and reservoir. Samples are then packaged according to IATA um, standards and shipped off to the NICD for, um, for diagnostic testing. But our program currently in effect since um, it was reinstated in 2017 builds upon the success of a previous program um, under uh, which was a European Union funded program known as RATSUMAN, which stands for Rodent Zoonotic Management. Um, and just in terms of the Etiquini context, this is a paper by my predecessor, um, Taylor et al, published in 2008, where rodents were trapped over a period of three years. Um, in their study, they reported a total of 262 live trapped rodents of five species. And um, luckily, none of those tested rodents were positive for plague. However, Nine Norway rats were positive for toxoplasmosis, another zoonotic disease of human health importance, and 22 of the samples tested positively for leptospirosis, another disease of human health importance. So again, just highlighting how important these uh, surveillance programs can be in ensuring public health. Whoops, sorry. Um, so obviously through this, we have amassed um, numerous uh, specimens and associated biomaterials. Um, and until recently, we thought that we only had one of two rat species. The first one being the, law, the, 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 the smaller, more um, nimble Rattus rattus. Um, you can see here, um, slender bull, very, very long tail, very agile uh, climbers as well and the more well-known Norway rat, chunkier, more robust animal. However, using the biomaterials stored by the Durban Natural Science Museum, a team of scientists showed that there was in fact a hidden invader that had gone undetected. 
Teratus tanazumi or the Oriental or Asian rat. Now, this species, the reason being that it had gone um, undetected in our collections is that it is morphologically identical to Ratus ratus. So both Peter and myself had actually identified these animals as belonging to Ratus ratus. However, Bastos et al. 2011, as I said, using biomaterials from the Durban Museum, actually showed that um, some of the Ratus ratus samples at least belong to Ratus tanazumi. Another potential um, vector for um, rodent uh, associated diseases. Sorry, the slide advance is really slow. So just to unpack a bit from the study and um, an, an anecdotal uh, story that I like to share. This is table one from the Bastos et al 2011 paper. And I highlight um, the sample DM8685. Um, if you're a collections person like me, very passionate about um, your specimens and finding any opportunity to collect a specimen. I was an intern at the time. This is a picture taken um, my now um, husband, his uncle's farm in Richmond in the Burn Valley in KZN. And this is dear Lulu sitting on the rafters uh, um, at the farmhouse. Um, and I was, it was the time that I was being introduced to the family as, for lack of a better word, the future Makoti. Lo and behold, I go outside and I see Lulu coming down the rafters with a big fat rat in her mouth. And I just could not help myself. I had to go run after um, Lulu and the rat and try and get it as a specimen. So this is sort of what kind of it looked like that Christmas um, morning. Me running after a cat, running after a rat. I got the rat. After much negotiating, I managed to get it um, into one of the freezers. And yeah, it made its, uh, this particular sample made its way into the paper. And although we had identified it as Rattus Rattus, it absolutely turned out to be, would you believe it or not, Rattus Tanazumi. So anyway, thank you, Lulu, for your contribution to science. Now, this is an unpublished study. Um, however, I thought it quite um, apt to, to show. It is um, from an honors dissertation that actually modeled all the known and molecularly identified uh, samples of Rattus tanazumi in South Africa to actually show that this species could potentially be more widespread. It is only known from the eastern and northeastern parts of South Africa, but the potential for it to be more widespread in, in the country as shown by ecological niche models um, is, is quite real. So just some um, auxiliary research linked to the Ratsuman pro, uh, program, and this is um, almost the, the, the last of the presentation. Um, researchers from UKZN um, uh, used uh, and utilized some of the rats um, under the, the Etiquini plague surveillance program to screen for endoparasites. They collected uh, organs from just under 400 rats species. And what they found was eight endoparasites of human health importance, as well as the first record of rat lungworm, um, the causative agent of e eosinophilic uh, meningitis in South Africa. So again, if we did not have these specimens available, and if we did not have um, an up and running surveillance program, all of this would not be known. So in closing, and if you have not come across this paper yet, I strongly encourage you to Google it and to actually download and read it. This is a paper by Thompson et al. 2021, so a very recent paper, on the importance of natural history collections and their role in zoonotic disease um, research, as well as surveillance. However, we are all aware of present challenges um, certainly from a museum point of view, GRAP 103 has, has actually shown that, you know, it's required some slight amendments and adjust, uh, adjustments to our acquisitions policy in that can we, we have to ask the question, can we actually catalog everything? Although having collections of invasive alien species such as rats is important, we are now having to be a bit more selective with just how many of these specimens we actually catalog into the collection. 
And of course, for those of you that have heard, um, Section 20 um, of the Animal uh, Disease Act of 1984 has put in new stipulations regarding um, infrastructure needed at our institutions to safely collect samples for disease testing and in terms of general specimen processing. So these are challenges that we are trying to rise to the challenge and of course work um, with departments such as the Department of Agriculture, Land Reform and Rural, Develop uh, rural Development towards a, a common goal um, of ensuring human health um, and well public health. And of course again I hope that this talk has highlighted just how important cross-disciplinary cross approaches are to public health as summed up under the One Health concept. And I thank you for your attention and I welcome any questions. And these are just uh, some departments and people that I would like to, to acknowledge. Thank you so much for your time. Take care, everyone. Thank you so much, Lee. What an interesting talk. Um, I think today we have proven or we have highlighted just how um, important natural science collections are. We, our, our speakers have proven that they are important in agriculture and in public health. So if you didn't know this, I am glad that today you know, and um, we can do more work in these collections. We have uh, two questions, both from Wayne Florence, from Eziko. Um, so I believe the first one was for Simon, and then the second one will go to Lee. So for Simon, uh, Wayne asks, Clearly, museum collections have significant value to decision making regarding a whole host of priorities throughout Africa. In this case, food security seems to be a priority, with only the known, with only the known only being five to twenty percent. The implications for decision makers is that they may only have a fraction of the information they need. In this regard, we have samples a lot, but the resources and high throughput methodologies do we do we need on the ground to generate and disseminate the knowledge that we generate to improve our service to applied scientists, thereby improving our confidence in our decision making. I know that was a lot sen a, a long sentence, but it has a question mark at the end. <laughs> um, I hope that was clear, Simon. Yeah, you know, this comes back to the fact that um, we've got this amazing gold mine of unlocked resources in museum collection. And we simply don't have the capacity to unlock uh, this information, this baseline data. And this is, you know, we really need to leverage funding to be able to do this. And uh, this comes down to um, getting research assistants, research technicians involved, uh, creating posts for um, these positions to process and curate this material. And, uh, you know, we can't make informed conservation management decisions. We can't contribute to food security and, and health and agriculture and forestry. And, you know, it goes on and on and on. There's this massive, massive potential um, for utilization of uh, species data that we've got in our collections. It's, at the moment, it's, it's not available. A lot of it is but that's a small fraction of um, what is actually out there. So the, the potential is massive and it comes down to um, mobilizing resources, uh, you know, finding funding to employ collections assistants to, and technicians to, to um, work up this material. It's incredibly important. And even more so now because it's a race against time. We lo we're losing species faster than we can and discover and describe them. Um, and yeah, we, if we carry on the way we are now, um, we're destroying our own very own life support system. Uh, and it's just, 
it's not sustainable into the, into the future. Um, drastic, drastic action needs to be taken. And maybe some of you listened to Mornay Duplessis talk the other day. Uh, he's a WWF director. And um, yeah, it's dire. Uh, the consequences are dire. Uh, we really need to take action now. Definitely. Thank you. Thank you, Simon. Um, Wayne, I am sure you were satisfied with that answer. Um, and then to Lee from Wayne, great work documenting infected threats and potential risk. Just out of interest, how many people have been infected with plague since your program was initiated? Is this data easily accessible and used in any way to make correlations with your collections data. Lee, you're muted. Computer, sorry, apologies for that. So let me just um, update you from 2017 with regards to the rat samples that have been processed. It's just uh, over 120 samples. None have tested positively for plague. And as far as I'm aware, in terms of human cases, um, and I could be mistaken, I actually need to um, follow up and, and confirm this. I think there's only been one within recent times, um, one case of human plague, but I think that that was in the case of a person traveling from um, another area. Um, of, of late, we, there has been um, plague outbreak in Madagascar, and of course, with being um, toasted as Africa's busiest um, harbor, um, that's, that is the, the, the viewpoint of this continued surveillance. Unfortunately, nothing in terms of anything in, happening in, in Etiquini, um, but the surveillance continues nonetheless. Um, people are more mobile. Um, we saw how quickly COVID spread uh, globally. And, and so, yeah, it's, it's rather be proactive than, than reactive. Hmm. Thank you, Lee. Um, there's a response by Wayne. He says the monitoring work is critical to keep us to keep us plague free. Great work. Thank you so much. Um, thank you, Wayne, for your questions. And I see there are no more questions. So um, I guess it's time for us to close. Our apologies for going a bit over time, but I believe you don't mind because I don't because I enjoyed those talks so much. Um, I wasn't even worrying, worried about time. So I would just like to say thank you to all our speakers. Um, thank you, Simon. Thank you, Robin. And thank you, Lee such informative talks. I see also on the chat, people are appreciative of the talks and they enjoyed them. Um, but to everyone, thank you for attending this webinar. Um, and to, do remember to keep in touch with us on our social media platforms, on Facebook, uh, Twitter, Instagram, YouTube, especially YouTube because the recording is going to be up there. So you can go and check it out. Um, even if you don't understand something completely, you can go and do a rewind there. You can also keep in touch with us on our website, nscf.org.za. And um, just to note, these presentations were um, are also in written form in our showcase, the value of collections showcase that you can find on our website if you go to the resources tab and you go to the value of uh, natural science collections, you will find them there. Um, thank you so much and keep well, have a good weekend and I hope you're going to rest. I know this group of natural science. <laughs> I don't think they like to rest, but please do rest and we will see each other for those in the network who will see each other next week. Thanks everyone and goodbye. <laughs>